I'm already a millionaire in my mind. I may not see it yet, but I believe it now. In the same way a seed is called by its finished form, I'm accepting my divine inheritance as a child of God. I'm meant to have life and have it more abundantly. My treasure on earth shall correspond directly to the treasure in the heaven of my mind. Abundance is my birthright. Ashe, amen, and so it is. My name is Julian Gordon, and I'm author of Rich and Righteous, Spiritual Secrets to Mastering Money, Manifestation, and Your Mind. After becoming a multimillionaire through real estate investing, I was moved by God at the beginning of the pandemic to share my money mindset that allowed me to quit my job in January of 2009 at the bottom of the last recession and achieve full financial freedom. I own my mental real estate before I own any physical real estate. This book is like some of your favorites, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, As a Man Thinketh, Think and Grow Rich, and the Bible all in one. But the divine downloads and thoughts that are in here are 100% original and came to me over a six month period at the beginning of the pandemic. This book is normally $100 on Amazon if you went there right now, but I wanna give you access to it for free by inviting you to our next reading group. Yes, the reading group is 100% free. Every weekday for 100 days straight, I'll be reading and discussing the 10 money commandments in the book that make money come to you in your life easily, more frequently and abundantly. And it will take about 30 to 45 minutes as we read three to five pages per day until we finish the book and reprogram your mind around money. Why 100 days? Well, if you are 30 years old, you've lived for 10,950 days. And we have to deprogram and reprogram the negative scarcity-based money mindset society has taught you. And I believe I can do that in just 1% of the time in about 100 days. I'm done with shelf help. You know, when you buy a book to change your life, but you never read it, it just sits on your bookshelf and collects a whole bunch of dust, we off that. When is the last time you had an author actually read their book to you out loud because they cared about you getting the information in your soul? I'm not just here to get this book in your hands. More importantly, I wanna get it in your head and your heart because that's where the real transformation occurs in the conscious and the subconscious mind. As scripture says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is not the type of book that you just read once. To renew the subconscious mind requires repetition over and over and over. So if you joined us last time, I encourage you to join us again. I myself have read this book over 10 times already. So click the link to join our next reading group. And when you sign up, I'm gonna give you the first two chapters of the book for absolutely free on what is money and abundance is your birthright so that you can start your journey to a more abundant life today. Rich Rising, Rich Rising, welcome to another day of Read Rich and Righteous. We're reading Rich and Righteous, Spiritual Secrets to Mastering Money, Manifestation, and Your Mind. We are on day 68. This is our last week of this 100-day money mindset reprogram. We are in the money commandment number nine, which is how the rich and righteous attract money. And today we're talking about being grateful to give. A lot of people talk about gratitude all the time. And I want to give you uh, some more clarity and insight into what gratitude is and how it works and how more gratitude in your life will lead to more abundance and so uh with that i want to just celebrate everybody who is actually in the 60s who has been here consistently over this entire 13 actually we're in the middle of week 14 now uh this 14 week journey is just really inspiring to see how this space and this community has um got you to show up for yourself and you know before we go off to work we actually and work for money we are actually here understanding how money works so that we can have a help better and healthier relationship to this and get beyond the time for money trap and so uh just grateful uh, for you allowing me to lead you in this way. You know that we have Rich and Righteous graduation this Saturday, 8.30 to 11 a.m. 150 people live here in Atlanta and the rest of you will be live streaming. Uh, so you can go to rrgraduation.com for that. Uh, make sure you get your ticket for that so you don't miss um, that final reading, the testimonies or testimonies, um, as well as the book signing for those of you who come in person. Um, for those of you who happen to be finding this late um, and are just joining the journey, you can join us at richrightnow.com at richrightnow.com. When you buy the ebook or a physical copy of the book, you will get access to all the replays that you have missed so that you can catch up. And for those of you who are in the 50s, 40s, uh, 30s, even brand new um, in terms of consistency score, that's going to be the best way to get access to all of these teachings that we've been doing over the past 14 weeks. All right. So with that, I want to jump straight into the reading. We are on page 370. Type I got it when you got it. Type I got it when you got it. Only five days left, family. Only five days left. All right. So today's chapter is grateful to give, and the scripture is 2 Corinthians 9 7. 
Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. And so um, I know a lot of you have been um, uh, persuaded to tithe, persuaded to tithe. And so uh, we're going to address that uh, today. Giving and receiving go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. When you are truly giving, we never give to receive. Okay. When we are truly giving, and I believe that giving is the default nature of children of God. Okay. When we are truly giving, we're not, and we're never giving to receive. That's not our intention for giving. Despite knowing, based on universal law, that when we give, we shall receive. The law of giving and receiving is not meant to be manipulated. It works best when our intention is pure and we're giving to return good energy, not to get a return. You are never giving to God. God is the giver and God gives through you. Nothing can supply the infinite source of supply. That would suggest that God could be added to. But God is all there is, the Alpha and Omega. It pleases God to see us give to each other, but God doesn't need anything from you, just like your parents didn't need anything from you when you were a child. God just wants to pour into you so that you can be the best child of God to children of God uh, you can be. God is like a parent with so many kids that the siblings must start taking care of each other. How many of you, how many of you had a whole bunch of siblings and you didn't have no childhood because you was babysitting your, your newborn sister, right? Um, I know that happens and uh, this is how this operates. We are here to serve one another. And uh, this divine download has come throughout this experience, but we are, we are God's hands on earth. We are God's hands on earth, right? And so God is giving through us. God is giving through us, okay? God gives to us and through us, all right? And so we want to be open to receive from the most high, and then we what we receive, we want to give. And we've, we received it freely, and we give freely uh but we're gonna freely i don't mean just fine by financially we want to give freely in terms of as much as possible right we want to circulate this money but we have to do it in a way that is financially sustainable that's what allows us to continue to give freely so when i say freely do not mistake that for free okay the trick is that god doesn't give to you for you your gifts are not for you they are for others God is giving to your siblings through you and your purpose. The real reward of your gift is not the gift itself. To say, look at me, I was born, uh, I was born to sing. I was born to build, business, uh, build a business. I was born beautiful is not where the fulfillment comes from. You had nothing to do with the potential inside of you. You had nothing to do with that. And so I'm glad that you were born beautiful. I'm glad that you were uh, have an amazing voice and it was just God-given talent. Right. I'm glad that you have this entrepreneurial knack, but that gift is not for you. You have it and it's in your possession, but it's not for you. That's like a kid born into a wealthy family bragging. Look at me. I'm so wealthy. Look at me. I'm so wealthy. You didn't create that wealth. You didn't create that wealth. Now, is it true that you are wealthy? Yes, but you didn't create that wealth when they did nothing to create or expand the wealth. Your fulfillment comes from the journey you experience discovering your gift, right? That's the first step. And then unwrapping your gift for others to experience, okay? I'm gonna repeat that again. Your fulfillment comes from the journey uh, the journey you experience discovering your gifts. That's the first step of the journey. There's all these things that I could do with my life, but I have to go on this journey of self-discovery to identify what makes me unique. What is my unique gift? And then the second step, right, is you unwrapping that gift for others to experience. So I discovered that I'm a great singer. Now, my second step, and I'm, that's been a great journey to develop that skill set and bless so many people with my voice. Now I want to unwrap that voice and I want to share it with as many people as possible. Uh, it is you seeing the God be revealed in the receiver as they experience your gift and the receiver seeing the God being revealed in you and through you as you give your gift to them. As Proverbs 18, 16 says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. Okay, A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. The more you give, the more you receive so that you can keep giving. 
God keeps giving to me and more, more and more because it knows that the buck does not stop here. Everybody say the buck does not stop here. You know, they say the buck stops here. Well, if the buck stops here, then that means that it's no longer flowing. And then why would God continue to give you more if you've now stored this energy and you're hoarding this uh, inert spiritual substance? This God given inert spiritual substance. Now you're hoarding it. Why would God can continue to give you more when you're not using what you have? So the buck does not stop here. Right. So these statements that we have, these aphorisms that we have in American culture, a lot of them actually don't support universal law. Right. It knows that when I receive it, I'm going to be a good steward and make the stored energy active as quickly as possible in a way that brings heaven on earth. The greatest good I can see for myself and others on earth in the material experience, my mental experience of life into the material experience. People say that it's not about what you make. It's about what you keep. The level above that is that how many heard that? It's not about what you make. It's about what you keep. How many of you heard that? See, there's a level above that. The level above that is that it's not just what you make or keep. It's actually what you circulate. It's all about what you circulate. That is true wealth. Giving is a demonstration of abundance and wealth consciousness. If you are ever experiencing lack in your life, you know what you should do? You should give. I know that sounds crazy. We know that there's the uh, story of the woman who only had two cents and she put it into the treasury and she was honored by Christ, right, for giving from her perceived lack while all the quote unquote wealthy people, even though they quantitatively gave more, they didn't give more in terms of, per, of a percentage of their possessions, right? And so in that moment, she was actually the most abundant. You cannot give and not be abundant. So giving is a way to trigger the abundance inside of you. And it doesn't matter how much. It's just being in a state of giving, all right. So giving is a demonstration of abundance and wealth consciousness. If you were ever experiencing lack in your life, give. Give. I remember oh, there was a moment where um, my business, my speaking business had plateaued and I was just it had flatlined in terms of the revenues and and the revenues were good. But I was like, God, I want to get to the next level. And you know what I did? <laughs> I wrote a ten thousand dollar check to a nonprofit. I wrote a $10,000 check to a nonprofit that teaches entrepreneurship to youth in New York City. And you want to know what happened literally within 30 minutes? Within 30 minutes, I got a call from my team member who said, I have some good news. The credit card processor has actually been holding over $100,000 of our money that we didn't know about because we were missing this form or document. Literally within 30 minutes of me making that donation. I activated my abundance by giving. Okay? So you were created perfect, whole, and complete. And everything you need is either in you or around you in the form of your six capitals. There are two types of giving and three things we give. The two types of giving include giving for free and giving for fee. Okay? Like I said, do not mistake giving freely with giving uh, for free, right? There's two types of giving. There's giving for free and giving for a fee, okay? Giving for free and giving for fee. Giving for free is the most common type of giving. Giving for fee is where you build a blessing model that allows you to give your gift to the world sustainably at scale and pair it with a business model that allows you to receive compensation to continue to accelerate the cycle. We talked about the business and blessing model, right? Giving is not just money. You can tithe with your treasure, which is money, your talents, which are your gifts, or your time, which is your energy. Money is the most common form of tithing, but it is the most passive. Even though it is great that you are channeling energy toward a cause you believe in, you don't have to actively serve anyone, which is the real gift of giving. Give your talent and time. Giving your talent and time means sharing your gifts that you could or normally would charge for. So you see a lot of people, a lot of singers come out of church. They're giving their gift freely in the name of God. You have to look within and determine where your fee line and your free line is. So there's got to be a line somewhere for all of you where if you've been giving for free, where is your fee line? At what point must you charge a fee so that you can continue to give freely? OK, for example, if you are a, re a restaurant, you may draw the line and say that I give three hundred dollars worth of food 
to four organizations per month. If you are a speaker, because if all these, let's say, student organizations, I remember at UCLA, we would go into Westwood and we add, we'd ask these restaurants uh, to donate food to our meetings and things of that nature. Now, if I'm a restaurant and I just say yes to everyone, that's actually going to put me out of business, which then cuts off my giving. And so they have to draw a line and say, we give away $300 worth of food for, uh, uh, to four organizations per month. So that's a $1,200 budget. After that, we got to continue to run the profitable side of our business so that we can continue to give in this way. Is this making sense? If you are a speaker or a singer, you might draw the line and say, I do four free events per year, two for churches and two for public schools. After that, I have a fee. Okay. Doing too much for free may make giving your gift unprofitable and therefore unsustainable. Now, here's the trick is like, wait, my gift was given to me freely, though, Julian. Shouldn't I give it freely? Yes, you're giving it freely, but it still costs you to develop that gift and to deliver that gift. And your gift should not become a burden. Your gift is supposed to do what? It's supposed to make room for you. It's supposed to make room for you, not make you feel constricted. Right. It should never be that way. And so if you are feeling constricted by your gift, so many people are pulling on your gift and your gift isn't making room for you, then you're using your gift in the wrong way. You're probably not charging the right amount. Your free line and your fee line are probably too far upstream and you need to come downstream and say, this is the point that I start charging a fee for my gift. Your gift is supposed to be able to support you and feed you. A fee allows you to feed not only yourself, but also the gift. A fee allows you to feed not only yourself, but also the gift, okay? It also means you have to earn money elsewhere by doing something that doesn't involve giving your gift. So, well, yeah, I, I work I work 40 hours um, doing this and um, I have to, and then I give my gift on the weekends. Well, do you think that God would design it that way? Do you think there's a possibility that you can actually be giving your gift all the time, not just after your 40 hour work week? That is the ultimate goal, right? That is the ultimate goal so that you can be in the giving of your gift because at that job, you're replaceable. Anybody could be doing that thing and eventually AI or a computer is gonna be able to do that thing. What, we're, what we want to look for is your unique gift and how you can stay in your unique gift as much as humanly possible. You, could, you can and should be paid for your gifts and purpose, but oftentimes it feels awkward charging for a gift you were freely given. The first priority is giving your gift to the world sustainably, and then the second priority is you giving freely from the abundance your gift has blessed you with. If you prefer to separate giving your talent from giving your time, you can volunteer in ways that don't involve your talent but are still in service to others, such as mentoring, cleaning up the community, or serving on boards of directors. So... If you do decide to give freely, don't attach it to your gift. Say my gift is sacred, my gift is valuable, right? And it blesses others and I charge for that gift. The way I give freely that doesn't require a fee is I give in this way, but it doesn't involve my gift. You want me to sing, that's my gift. I get paid to sing and to bless people with my voice, right? I don't do that for free, but I will come volunteer at the toy drive. I will come... Uh, uh, volunteer for the food drive. I'll volunteer for that, but it won't involve my gift. You separate the two to make a distinction in the minds of those who are asking for or pulling on your gift. Is this making sense? God loves a cheerful giver, but there are times when giving is not always cheerful. When we give to fulfill the immediate needs of someone else then we are that we are not anticipating, it can feel more like a have to than a choose to. Perhaps a family member needs help with a car fix or medical expenses or a natural disaster hurts a community and you want to contribute to its recovery. Often these situations come with distress, drama, and sometimes even death. While we are happy to give in the moment, in the moment from our abundance, the moment is usually not a happy one. I call it superhero giving, when you give to save the day. You have to discern when this type of giving is warranted. If the same person or organization is always in distress... Some of you got people like this, some of them your parents, some of them your kids. If the same person or organization is always in distress, then there is likely a poverty consciousness that must be addressed in them first or else the cycle will never end. They will constantly be relying on you to support them. OK, now you have a dependent and you're in a codependent relationship. You should also give in a way that makes you feel good. 
Okay, we don't just want to give in emergency situations. You should also give in a way that makes you feel good, right? God loves a cheerful giver in the amount you desire when the time is right for you. This is scheduled giving. So there's superhero giving where you're seeking to save the day because somebody or uh, some organization is in immediate need right now, right? And that usually doesn't feel good. So I want you to explore scheduled giving which is the amount that you desire when the time is right for you. Where superhero giving is unplanned, scheduled giving is planned. For many people, the holidays are a time of giving, whether it be giving away free turkeys, coats or toy drives, or donations to nonprofits. For those who tie to a church, scheduled giving is monthly. I've enjoyed raising money towards, uh, towards the end of the year for causes I care about. Given my passion for multifamily real estate, I found a unique way for me to give through the sale of this book. Every December, I will be dedicating all proceeds from this book. So yes, as of uh, recent, uh, December sales are dedicated to help pay the rent and mortgage of families in need through the Rent Free Foundation. This aligns my passion for real estate, which has blessed me financially with the principles of this book, promoting wealth consciousness and with my genuine heart for helping people all in one. I encourage you to explore what kind of giving gives you the most joy while also bringing joy to others. And so we will likely raise some money um, through book sales uh, at the graduation for the Rent Free Foundation um, and see if we can bless some people who are struggling uh, with their mortgage payment or rent payment in this particular season. So you see how uh, through my schedule giving, I've tied in all of my passions into the way that I want to give, a way that actually makes me the most cheerful giver okay now tithing in that way is the it, it, it tithing in the way that it has been taught is false doctrine i hope you're all ready for this we got any tithers in here i'm about to free you tithing in the way that it has been taught is false doctrine all uh, all giving in, in is good in my eyes but don't let anyone pressure you into giving by saying God said so, right? Because if you go back to the scripture, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of us should give what you have decided in your heart to give, right? Who made up 10%, right? The first example of tithing was, uh, who was it? Was it, um, was it not Moses? It was in, uh, is in, I think in Exodus, it was a tithe to Melchizedek, I believe, by, I forgot who it was uh, by. But it doesn't say you have to tithe. In the same way that I still don't know the legal document where I'm supposed to pay taxes in the United States. I don't know where it actually says that. <laughs> I pay, but where does it say it? But going back to the scripture anyways, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a true forgiver. So many churches have actually... Um, condition their people to give under compulsion, right? Saying that you're going to hell if you don't give a tithe. You owe God. You're robbing God, this and that. Listen, family. All giving is good in my eyes, but don't let anyone pressure you into giving by saying God said so. God loves a cheerful giver, not a guilty one. God loves a cheerful giver, not a guilty one. As 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each of you should give uh, what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God, God does not want 10% of what you earn from a job that is not aligned with what God created you to do. God does not want 10% from a job, right, not aligned with what God created you to do. It just doesn't make sense. God, I'm working this job that's not in alignment with my purpose, and I got some money from it, and I'm going to give that to you. And that's going to put us, that's going to make us even, right? That's how I'm going to pay you. No. God wants your entire life, not your leftovers. God wants your entire life, not your leftovers. Tithe that 10% to the temple of your mind first. This is the first temple that you must tie to, into yourself, whether that's through knowledge, whether it's through self-care, right? You have to tithe into yourself first, into this temple, whether it's therapy, life coaching, business coaching, 
How are you growing yourself? You're spending all this energy to grow other people's dreams and visions. How are you pouring into yourself? This is the first temple to tithe to. They deceived you. God does not dwell in temples made with the hands of man. Scripture says that. So what is the only temple not made with the hands of man? It's this. So this is the temple that you must tithe to. And I could go deeper. And actually, we will go deeper in just a second in terms of the history. Okay. So tithe that 10% to the temple of your mind first. After you've established an emergency fund, pour into your emergence fund for your personal growth and development. So there's your emergency fund to cover any downside risk if something were to happen to your one or two streams of income. But then after that, there's your emergence fund. Your emergence fund, that is how you are going to emerge and become all that you were meant to be. Emergence is the process of coming into being and you are the greatest gift you can give to the world, okay? Build yourself up, not the building fund. Build yourself up. Not the building fund. As Paul said, your body is a temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. If your church is contributing to your growth and development, then surely, yes, give, but never feel obligated to give. Tie 10%, 10 to yourself for personal growth, 10% to your health to maintain the body temple, and then at least 10% to your wealth by investing. Okay, that's 30% just out the gates. Many churches have guilt tripped people into poverty. What they fail to realize is that the church would have much more if it recognized if its congregation was wealthy. The church would have much more if the congregation was wealthy. 10% of a lot is way more than 10% of a little. 10% of a lot is way more than 10% of a little. But this is why you can drive down a, a street in um, on Crenshaw. You can drive down Crenshaw or Rosecrans, right? And you just see church after church after church after church. But poor people after poor people after poor people after poor people. Well, there's some gentrification happening now. But why is it that there are so many churches, but the communities are still poor? And then some churches, these mega churches, look like stadiums in the midst of poverty. Right? Who's getting who? Right. And how come that money is only staying in the building? And it's not coming out into the community. Right. I don't I, some backpacks for schools and some turkeys. That ain't nearly what you receive from this. How come I've been tithing? But then when I actually need help and I have an emergency in my life, I can't get any help from you. But I've been tithing all this time. And you, you just say, uh, just pray. I'll pray with you. Make that make sense, family. So let's break it down just so that you are aware for those of you who have uh, been in religious settings that have tried to pressure you into tithing and giving from a historical perspective tithing was for the Levites okay and they are almost all gone now since the Levites took care of the temple right they were the only tribe that didn't have land and so the other tribes tied their land and animals to support the Levites because they were focused on the temple not in any money-making activities in the beginning tithes were not money family in the beginning, tithes were not money. They came from natural reproduction of the land, right? Fruits and vegetables and animals orchestrated by God, right? Money is not orchestrated by God. Money is man-made. The original tithes were things that had natural reproduction within them because of God. So harvest. Tithes were primarily for people, not places. Tithes were primarily for people, not places. Physical churches are one of the worst forms of real estate ever. Many are only used at full capacity one day per week for half a day, right, on Sunday. Acts, as Acts 17, 24 says, the, uh, the God that made the world and all the things therein, he being Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Jesus never built a physical church. And I don't think he would have had he lived any longer. Yes, Jesus spoke to large audiences, but he would not have built a mega church. At the financial church, right, we take an offering, but it isn't for me, for my foreign car, which is actually a Honda. You know, a Honda is a foreign car. People on Instagram with a foreign car, look at me. My Honda Accord is a foreign car, family. <laughs> How many of y'all got foreign cars out there? You got a Hyundai Sonata? You got a foreign car. <laughs> okay? So at the final financial church, we would take an offering, but it wasn't for me or for my foreign car, or for a building fund. 
I take no money from this space whatsoever. I'm blessed to be able to give freely here. We give out of the offering we receive to individuals in need or nonprofits doing good or God's work within 40 hours eight hours of receiving it so that money that comes in is not just sitting somewhere in an account i'm not trying to accrue interest on it we're literally trying to get it back into use within 48 hours of receiving it the money or stored energy shouldn't sit in a bank account somewhere doing nothing it should immediately feed the poor shelter the homeless and help those in need james 2 14 through 17 says what does it profit my brethren if someone says he uh someone says he has faith but does not have works can faith save him if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to him depart in peace be warmed and filled but you do not give him give them the things which are needed for the body what does it profit thus also faith by itself if it does not have works is dead this is how I believe spiritual giving should occur without coercion. We have to be better at turning the change in the collection plate into change in the world. When you give, no matter how you give, how much you give, what you give or who you give to make your offering pleasing to God. Luke 24 or 21, 4, 1 through 4 says, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor widow put in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. The message was not to give our last to the church for the promise of some pie in the sky after you die. The message was to give your all, not only your not only your excuses or or your excess or your leftovers. The message was to give your all, not just your excess or your leftovers. It says from your livelihood, which is your all, which is giving your all from an energetic standpoint, not just a monetary one. The woman was in poverty from an external definition of poverty, but she had an abundance mindset, whereas the others were materially rich, but spiritually poor. God doesn't measure your offerings based on the amount you give compared to others, but by how much you give you've given in comparison to how much you were given. I'm going to repeat that. God doesn't measure your offerings based on the amount you give compared to others, but by how much you've given in comparison to how much you were given by God. OK, again, when we go to the parable of the talents, one servant was given five, the other one was given two and the other one was given one. So we don't all initially receive equally right and you will be judged according to what you were given and how much you were able to give from what you were given all right not in comparison to how much somebody else gave and this, this is why they have a front seat at the pew uh, at the church because uh they give more than the people who are making a lot less than them it's not how this works family that is not divine democracy all right so as we covered earlier, to whom much is given, much will be required. Luke 12, 48. It is expected that we will use what we've been given for greater good, not just use it for our own benefit. Give because of the right reasons, not because someone told you it was right to give. Give because of the right reasons, not because someone told you it was right to give. Give because you want to, not because you feel you have to. Give because it feels good, not because of guilt. Give because of what you've already received, not to receive something back. If you give with a pure heart, the cycle of giving and receiving will always be active in your life and your capacity to give will constantly increase. Giving begets receiving, which begets more giving, which begets more receiving, and so on and so on forever more all right so i think i shared this with you before is that um a philanthropist right phil means love as in city of brotherly love philadelphia right it's 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 a love for other people right um philanthropist is a lover of humanity and so you are already a philanthropist regardless of how much is in your bank account a lot of people think they need to wait to become a millionaire to be a philanthropist. You are already a philanthropist if you are a lover of humanity. It doesn't matter. There's no requirement in the dictionary that says you have to be a millionaire to be a philanthropist. And so the exercise in the rituals workbook um, is on page 93, and it's the philanthropy plan. And I want you to go through this before we get back tomorrow. This is your homework for tonight is to go through the philanthropy plan. 
philanthropy plan and complete that. That is the exercise that you see at the end of the chapter, okay? And so uh, if you don't have the Rituals Workbook, um, you can go to richrightnow.com forward slash store, richrightnow.com forward slash store, and uh, get that. Um, it's just going to anchor these principles into your life and make them more real. Uh, again, the truth alone will not set you free. It's acting on the truth that will set you free, all right? So the first temple that we're supposed to tie to is the temple of our minds, right? It's not these buildings. It's not these buildings. God does not dwell in temples made by the hands of man. God dwells in you, though. And so we have to take the energy that we've earned and put it back into ourselves because that's actually what causes us to grow. So we want 10% to go back into ourselves. We want 10% to go into the body temple, making sure that we're eating right, that we have the proper insurances and health care and things of that nature. And we want 10% at least to go into investing so that we are multiplying that money. Now, the other 70%, right, uh, we've given you the cash flow framework to run and flow that money in that way, give you your fun fund and your sacred stash so that we can continue to invest. This is how we think about money and giving, right? But we as ch children of God, we're default givers, but we have to learn how to receive. We have to know where our free line and our fee line must be so that we aren't working 40 hours a week not doing our gift and then only giving our gift sometimes after being burned out by that job, but that there is a way and there is a possibility for you to be in your gift all the time. I'm a living demonstration of that. You see me here every day at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and even when we're not doing Read Rich and Righteous, I'm in my gifts. My gifts have made room for me, family, all right? So until tomorrow, uh, be God to yourself. Love yourself as God loves you. Be master over yourself in the way that God is master over you. And remember that you are God, lowercase g, or first cause in your own life, and that no individual institution or situation outside of yourself has more power over the trajectory of your life than you. Tomorrow we will be back, and um, we will be talking about receiving as a skill. Uh, as children of God, we're default givers, and one of uh, the muscles that we've atrophied and that needs to develop and strengthen is our receiving muscle because receiving and giving go hand in hand. So I will see you tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, family. Love you. Peace. What's up, y'all? It's Julian Gore from the Most High Family Movement, and this is my community behind me. It's 300 of us out here in Baton Rouge for our tour of our commercial properties, our flips, our vacant lots. We're also raising money uh, just to build this real estate portfolio collectively through group economics. So it's so beautiful to see everybody here. We six buses deep. This is also our building behind us at Legacy on 14th Street. So this is real estate in real life, and this is real people. This is not just some online community or course. We out here really doing it together as a collective. So this is family, multi-family movement in the building. Everybody say multi-family on three. The whole crew, y'all. So, when you want to learn how to get in the game. Much love. Peace.